Hey everybody, what's going on? It is James here with Crypto Common Sense, and I have a Bitcoin slash cryptocurrency market update for July the 8th. Before I jump into the content for this video, do me a favor, hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and of course, make sure you check the description. There are links down there where you can join one of my trading classes if you'd like to learn how to trade, or you can of course subscribe to my new trading view indicators which do most of the heavy lifting for you. They run technical analysis and then spit out buy and sell signals that you can set up alerts for and also automate through third party tools. So first things first, let's talk about the market. Let's talk about what happened this week. Well, nothing unexpected. If you watched my last video on July the 3rd, I posted this video. I posed the question, have Bitcoin slash stocks bottomed? And in that video, I expressed a belief that no, they had not bottomed long term, but they had bottomed temporarily and were due for quite a relief bounce. Something some people would refer to as a dead cat bounce, a relief rally, a counter trend rally, whatever you want to call it, they were due for a move up. Let's talk about that move up. Let's talk about how it's playing out. And let's talk about what I expect next. So in that previous video, we did take a look at this chart. This is Bitcoin versus the QQQ. Of course, this is the chart that I had posted originally back in November of last year, showing that I felt that move to 69,000 was actually a complacency bounce and that we are due for a move down. We've got that move down. In the last video, I talked about the fact that I felt like we were due a denial bounce. And that's what we seem to be getting right now. And then of course, more downside after that. So one thing about this bounce, this is kind of a macro chart or a little bit larger time frame chart. One thing about this bounce that you need to be very, very careful of is getting in the way of a moving train. All right. I looked today at coinalize.net and at the time that I looked over $50 million in short positions were liquidated. And to me, that's just insane because why would you be shorting Bitcoin? when it's already down almost 70%. So the last three or four days, definitely not unexpected, right? We expected the bounce when looking at this chart back on July the 3rd, and we are getting a bounce. The one thing that is somewhat surprising about this bounce, it's actually weaker than what I expected it to be, right? If you look at the volume, let's turn volume on. Look at the terrible buying volume on this. I really felt like this was going to like have a lot more momentum behind it, right? We are putting in a double bottom on the daily chart, right? I'm still rooting for Bitcoin. So those of you that are like, you're a bear, you hate Bitcoin. No, I don't hate Bitcoin. I think it's going lower, right? I think eight to 12,000 still in the cards and possibly lower than that if stocks have a hard time. But short term, I'm actually rooting for Bitcoin to move back up, right? I'd like to see it retest that 200 moving average, right up around 36 or 37,000 up in that zone. I'd like to see it retest kind of the bottom of this range, at the very least the bottom of this range back here, because where it sits right now, I cannot open new short positions. And I shared with my Discord a couple days back that I was out of all 100% of my bearish positions on Bitcoin. I had some uh, long running options some puts on Bitcoin and I closed all of them, right? Uh, did very, very well on those, uh, made several hundred percent, around 400% or so. But at this point, I'm not sitting in a Bitcoin trade. And so I need Bitcoin to move up so that I can get into a bearish position. So I'm a little bit disappointed to see just how weak this volume really is. I think this is, uh, you know, showing that people are just really unsure of what to expect from Bitcoin. Obviously, when we look at the volume candles, it's still the bears who are really driving this bus. Much larger selling candles than there are buying candles. Um, so this, you know, again, it is a double bottom. It's unconfirmed, though. To be a confirmed double bottom, it needs to actually close above this level right here. That would be a confirmed double bottom where you break and close above this midpoint, also called the neckline. right? And if we can get a break above that, then it's very possible what we see is a break. A retest and then possibly a move up to retest either this zone here or potentially if we go out to a weekly chart 
uh, even as high as maybe even 30 to 35,000. I mean, if it really, really got some oomph behind it, it could get all the way up and retest the bottom of this parallel channel, which would be wonderful, right? Because that would be an opportunity for me uh, to reevaluate. And if it, things still looked, you know, like it was heading to 8 to 12K, that would allow me to open bearish positions and make a lot of money on that next leg down. As it stands right now, again, it doesn't make sense to me that people are, were rushing into bearish positions back here. This was not bearish chart structure. This was not bearish, bearish price structure. At the very least, it was neutral. And in reality, I felt like it was bullish. Uh, again, I did that video on July the 3rd, which was that candlestick right there, the literal bottom before this rally. Okay, uh, so really, really basic technical analysis. There's just not that much going on. You just have to be listening to what the charts are telling you versus trying to read something on the chart that's not actually there. So that's the daily chart there, right? If we take a look at the CME chart real quick, this is the uh, Bitcoin futures over on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. We'll just look at price action. We won't worry about indicators right now. Again, we still have this bear flag that I had drawn up before it ever broke out, right? Showing this target down around $12,000. So it is moving steadily toward that target. But remember that gaps do like to fill and they like to fill both directions. So these gaps are filling in here from back in 2020. But with this big hard move down, it did actually gap below this range. You can see the gap right there. Whoops, trying to use being a little laggy. Right there, that big gap. It would be completely textbook market behavior to see Bitcoin move all the way back up to that level, fill in that gap, and then do something. Okay, that's weird. I didn't click fibs. Go all the way up here, fill in that gap, and then have its next move down. And again, if you think about that in terms of this chart here, which is the Bitcoin versus the QQQ chart, that would make perfect sense. That would be the denial bounds, right? My investments are with great companies. They will come back, right? People still believe, even right now, we are not seeing capitulation in the market. Hodlers still believe that Bitcoin is a store of value. It doesn't matter. It's been proven completely false. They have fallen victim to market mania, and it's not until it's all said and done that they'll be able to look back in hindsight and say, gosh, how could I have you know, been so silly? It's, it's just a weird mental thing, right? It's the same reason that cult leaders are able to do some of the things they're able to do, get people to do things that those people would normally never do. Well, cryptocurrency is a lot like a cult, right? Once you buy into the idea, it's very, very difficult to get your mind separated from that belief. So again, this chart is showing that the denial bounce is probably underway. This chart, it makes perfect sense that that denial bounce gets some momentum. It could go all the way back up and fill in this gap up around 2830K. This chart, same thing, you know, could go back up and retest this range, get back up to that 200 day moving average. Our 50 day moving average is going to be the first major line in the sand that we need to take out. And that's going to be right around $25,000, right? That's the 50 day moving average. So, you know, that could be a place that uh, shorter time frame traders look for some scalp shorts, like some bearish scalps, but it's not a place that I would expect a lot of traders to take positional shorts. I think that, you know, it's very possible that we get at something like this and then a move up, you know, fill in those gaps, etc., and then, you know, have that next leg down. Uh, let's go out. Let's take a look at a weekly chart real quick, because I think this will uh, and I'm going to pull up a chart that's not all mocked up so that it's pretty clean. So this is my uh, day trading chart for stocks really is what I use this for. But let's go out to the weekly Bitcoin chart and we'll just use, uh, it doesn't matter, we can use Binance or, uh, yeah, there's Binance. <laughs> okay, I didn't know that was on there, but uh, so yeah, this was that parabola that I had drawn, uh, you know, last year, saying that once you break a parabola, uh, traditionally you're going to retrace about 80% of that move. Doesn't mean you fall 80%. It's not like okay, it's a hundred thousand dollars now it goes to twenty thousand. What it means is 80% of that move, and so you can draw Fibonacci levels from the bottom to the top. And 80% of that move would be $15,996, which we are very, very close to, right? We came very close uh, last month to hitting that level. So 
that's nearly played out, um, but that's not what I want to talk about. Uh, what I really want to talk about is the volume, right? Let's get all the indicator stuff off and just look at volume. All right. If you go back and you look at, well, I actually can't use Binance. They don't have enough history. Let's look at uh, Coinbase. So if you go back and look at the bottom in 2018, let's put some indicators on there. We'll put a just a 200 week on there. Okay, so it comes down. This is a 200 EMA on the weekly chart. It comes down, sits right on top of it. You get the big capitulation candle. Right, we'll pull this up so it's easier to see. And then you have your range. It ranges for a few months. You know, accumulation takes place and you start your next cycle. In March of 2020, we came down and we retested that 200 EMA on the weekly chart. So if you compare these, both of these moves had the big sell-off retail capitulation, hodlers giving up, you know, losing all hope, so to speak. If you go over to what's happening now, we did have some capitulation volume back here in June, but we haven't really had any kind of buying volume to kind of step up and say, hey, you know, we're here. We think this is a good deal. The bottom is in. And more importantly, look at the moving average. That moving average, we're no longer above it. In 2018 at the bottom, we stayed on top of it. In 2020, we stayed on top of it. And here we are in 2022, closing not just one, but multiple candles under that level. So that's going to be another really important mine in the sand. If this can get back to that level, can it actually break through there? Because it's very cliche market behavior to break through a level of support or what I would call demand and then come up and retest that level of demand, flipping it to supply. This is what I would consider the level of demand through here. So it would be very cliche market behavior to come up and retest that. That's also where that 200 is at and then do this, all right? Um, so that is definitely what I am expecting right now. And of course, you, know, you put other indicators on there, you just start getting more and more convergence. So for example, if you put a visible range profile on there from the bottom in 2020 to current price action, we're actually inside of this giant gap, right? Volume gap, come up here, maybe retest this level of resistance and then come down here to this level of support slash demand down around 12K. If stocks are doing okay, that should hopefully hold and then range, fill in this whole area here and start a new cycle. If stocks are not doing well, if we really do kick off into you know a horrific recession, etc., I think we lose this level and then we end up going much lower. All right, but for short term trading, which is what really matters as a trader, right? I think the play right now is to look for this to move up. I'm not saying go out and long it. That's up to you what you do with that information. I'm just simply saying like as an analyst, right? Not as a trader, right? As a trader, things are different. Traders trade setups. Traders are trading risk management, all that kind of stuff. I'm saying as a market analyst and my role as an analyst, I think the market has a move up, right? I still believe that. I believed it four days ago. I don't think that move is done yet, okay? Um, but I think it's a dead cat bounce. That's what I think on Bitcoin. If we take a look at a monthly chart, you know, these are some really big selling volume. But again, we are now about a week, a little over a week in the July, and there's just no buyers stepping up here. So that's very, very sketchy. Of course, if you look and say, well, why did it stop where it stopped at? You know, it's kind of a random place, isn't it? Not at all. It closed the June candle right on top of the previous market cycle high, all right? Market cycle high back in 2017, of course, right around 20 grand. This candle closed right around 20 grand. So again, you break through a level of resistance, you come back down and you retest it as support, right? This is really just one big move up, retest this. And what it does from here, you know, if it comes here and goes down, you know, then that's one way. The other way is if it breaks through this level through here and flips that to support, then we can get something like this, okay? I think this is far less likely but that is, you know, the bullish possibility, if you want to call it that. All right. Again, I, if I'm laying odds, I'm laying that odds 90 
5% down, 5% that we go that bullish route, All right? And again, I'm talking about after, I believe that there's probably a 90% chance that we're going up first, right? This part, I'd say it's about a 90-10 that's happening. This part, again, 90-10 that's happening. This part, I'd say maybe like 5 or 10% chance of that happening and maybe like a 90% chance of that happening. All right, not necessarily to, to zero or, or negative, obviously. I'm just saying down, right, below this level here. So, yeah, that's Bitcoin. Let's look at, uh, we'll take one very quick peek at the stock market. I'm just going to look at the RUA. I'm not going to look at individual charts uh, because the RUA, again, is the majority of U.S. stocks. I said I believed that July would be a green month in the stock market. So far, that is exactly what is happening. All right. And for very simple reasons, right? Markets get overextended. The, the, that old cliche, markets don't move in straight lines. This is what they're talking about. Markets don't move in straight lines. We had three red monthly candles, right? And, and even this green candle was kind of a pause. So the market as a whole, like 97% of US stocks, when you measure them, they were down over 25%. This isn't crypto. 25% is a really, really big deal, right? The COVID drop was about 36%, okay? So it only made sense that we would get some kind of relief rally through there. If you go look at a weekly chart, I do not think that rally is finished yet. The reason I don't think it's finished yet is because if you look, this is a full body green candle. Then you have a red candle with a nice tail on it. And so far, this candle, which is going to close today, it has a nice tail and it's closing as a green candle. So we'll see how today plays out. But, you know, if this was like a... A downtrend that's going to go boom, 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 boom. I think this candle would have already, you know, been leaving behind a wick and started back down. This looks more like a candle that's going to do something like this to me. Maybe come back up to this level here, right? And then, you know, continue down from there. That's kind of what I'm thinking on the U.S. stock market. And again, you know, if you start looking like why there? Why did it stop where it stopped at? Well, you know, you did have levels back here. And those levels have been flipped, right? They were a supply or resistance. You see these two wicks left behind? Well, this comes down, puts a tail right on top of it. So again, it makes sense that that would be a place where there would be a potential bounce. As far as how high it bounces, yeah, you know, this was a, a bounce back to the 61.8. I think it's completely possible that if you measure this like this, you might get another bounce back up. Come on, trading view. You might get a bounce back up like this even all the way back up to this level here and then more downside right some kind of complacency bounce in stocks possibly so it's a it's a really interesting thing you know the markets and the way they're moving right now it's i don't want to say unprecedented but it, it's a lot different than what you know the last 10 or 15 years have been and so even like with me i've got to be careful i've got to really be on my toes because i started trading in 2017 right, in, in May of 2017. So I've only had five years, a little over five years, and a little, you know, about four and a half years now of doing this like full time. So I've never traded in a bear market in stocks, right? I've never traded in a recession before, unless you want to call like that month long weirdness in COVID 2020 a recession, whatever, right? I've never traded in those conditions. We've went from a quantitative easing environment to a quantitative tightening environment where you know interest rates are going up and uh, the fed is no longer injecting liquidity into the markets and so you know we have this this housing bubble that people are talking about um, i do personally believe there is a housing bubble you know i watched my own house go up like 50 percent in value in the last couple of years which is just crazy my brother actually owns a brand new car dealership the dealership itself is not brand new but they sell brand new cars right they're a franchise dealership and, uh, you know, like we talked about how weird the car market has been the last couple of years where, you know, he's actually having to go out to the car lot and increase the prices of cars because they keep going up in value versus every other year in the car business. And my brother's been in the car business since 2004, I believe. Uh, and I was in the car business back, you know, a long time ago. I mean, not a long time ago, but I left the car business in 2007, right? we did not mark cars up, we marked cars down. So it just everything is really, really weird right now. Um, but we are starting to see some signs that maybe there's some cooling off happening. 
and I don't want to make the video too long, but that's kind of the stock market there. I, I think that we do have a little bit of a bounce there. I think we've got you know more of a bounce in, in crypto. If we start taking a look at some other markets and kind of trying to get an idea of the like the whole picture. Like if you go look at lumber, I had done a video on lumber a few weeks ago, um, saying you know that I thought that there was a relief bounce uh, due in lumber that I thought it would have more downside, but that it would have a relief bounce first. And since that video, I shot that video literally on like June 4th, um, you know, lumber's up like 40% again, right? Again, just came back down, retested demand, it's bouncing off that. But I think that lumber's going through its kind of dead cat bounce here. And then I think we'll see more downside there. I think if you go look at things like copper, right? Copper is finally starting to cool off. Well. A lot of people say, who cares about copper? It's not gold, it's not silver, right? So who cares? Well, copper is a, like a leading indicator for uh, like the housing market, right? Copper goes up when housing demand goes up and they're building new houses and new buildings and things because guess what? Copper is used in plumbing, right? It's, a, it's one of the main components in those constructions. And so, you know, when those markets start to cool off and those bubbles start to pop, a lot of times you will see that with copper prices actually coming down. So we had this huge blow up candle in March of 2022, and it's just been red, red, red since then. And of course, this is a monthly chart, and copper is now broke completely below even this area back here. And I would really say that this was more the area that should have held right here, right? Um, so we are seeing signs that you know markets have kind of ran their course. If we take a look at crude futures, um, so over on the oil side, let's go down to uh, maybe a daily chart on oil, right? We're seeing that oil had a really, really rough uh, couple of days this week, right? Had a little bit of a dead cat bounce yesterday, or I shouldn't call it a dead cat bounce, just a bounce yesterday, sorry, uh, wrong terminology. But it did have a really rough day back on July 5th, and we're seeing demand actually drop for oil, right? Gas prices have risen so much, um, you know, when I started driving in the, the late, late 90s, uh, I was paying as little as 79 cents for a gallon of gas. And a few years ago, around here, where I'm at in uh, the rural part of America, you know, we were paying oftentimes $1.89 to maybe two nineteen a gallon, like in that ballpark. And when it was like two nineteen, we were like complaining about like, oh my gosh, gas is so high, right? Well, gas was nearly $5 a gallon um, a few weeks ago. And so... It's gotten to the point now where people literally can't afford to just go for a drive and people have started to kind of tighten the belt buckle and said, you know, they're starting to consolidate trips. And so I read this report, maybe it was about a week ago, where gas consumption is actually down about 6%, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're talking about, you know, millions of people, that's a lot. Um, you know, so demand is starting to fall back some. And so we are seeing some cooling off in the oil markets as well. So it just seems like, you know, um, the bubbles have started to kind of unwind. And again, I've talked about this in previous videos where, you know, bubbles pop and then the government kind of, the Fed rushes in to kind of reinflate the bubble by lowering interest rates and, you know, rolling out quantitative easing where they're, you know, adding liquidity to the market. But in this case, because of the massive inflation that the Fed caused by rolling out, you know, quantitative easing, way too soon, I have hiccups, I apologize. Uh, they really, there's not a whole lot they can do without, you know, causing other problems. They're, they are stuck very much between a rock and a hard place. Do they lower interest rates to try to save the market from crashing and cause even worse inflation? Or do they tackle inflation, raise the interest rates, but in turn, uh, pop the housing bubble, which is gonna have domino effects, right? A lot of people do not understand this, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this right here in this video and then this will probably be where I wrap things up. So much of what I do on this channel is technical analysis, right? That's really what I love. I love technical analysis, but sometimes you have to kind of break away from the technical analysis just for a few minutes and look at the common sense side of things and look at the logic of why are these things, you know, doing the things they're doing. And so let me give you an example um, just in the housing market, okay? Let's say, for example, that you uh, are buying a new home in, the United States. Last year, I believe the average price of a home was around $300,000. That's countrywide. Obviously, if you're in California, that's really, really cheap. If you're, you know, where I'm at in rural, um, you know, America, $300,000 buys you a really nice home. 
But $300,000 was the average. So 30 years, we're not going to talk about, you know, property taxes or anything like that. We're talking about just purely the, the loan itself, right? So $300,000 loan, last year interest rates were down under 3%. We're just going to say 3% for easy math. So you calculate that payment. That payment's $1,264. Now that's not too bad. Most people, even if they're working, you know, uh, jobs that don't pay the greatest, if there's a husband and wife combo both working, they're probably going to be able to swing that $1,200 house payment without too much grief. Okay. Now watch what happens when you change the interest rate from 3% to 6%. A lot of people think, ah, oh, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Except it is because that 1200 and something dollar house payment suddenly becomes $1,800. The house payment actually jumps by about 50% because of that 3% difference in interest rate. So as they raise interest rates, this gets worse and worse. And the problem becomes is people cannot afford houses anymore because of course, most people aren't actually walking up and buying a house with $300,000 in cash. They're financing that house. And so it's really not about can they afford 300,000, it's about can they afford the payment. Well, they could afford the 1,200, they can't afford the 1,800. Or if you look at areas like you know California where you might pay $700,000 for an average house, suddenly you know that payment is 4,200 bucks a month versus last year it might've been 2,900, right? It's literally about 45 to 50% more payment because of the higher interest rate. And so that's, you know, what the Fed is facing right now. And there's really not a lot they can do. They've either got to, you know, let the bubble pop or they've got to cause even worse inflation. And we're already sitting at, uh, you know, historic inflation levels, the highest levels we've seen since the early 1980s. Okay. Really, really um, bad stuff going on in the world. And that's why you look at the chart and the charts look really bad and the charts are predicting all these downsides. But a lot of people are still living in fairy tale land saying that can't possibly happen. That can't possibly happen because those people are 20, 25, 30, 35 years old and they've never lived through it before, right? I mean, even me, I'm 40 years old. I'm, I, I'm not old enough to remember the 1980s as far as markets go. I remember being a kid in the 1980s. I remember you know growing up in a trailer park in the 1980s, right? Um, but I never, I mean, we didn't talk about money. I mean, I, we had a home. It was a trailer in the you know, early mid eighties. And, you know, we had a car like every other family. It was a, you know, it was a bad car. I remember the floorboard was rusted out and you could actually see the street. Um, you know, there's like little holes in a floorboard. Uh, when it rained, the rain would sometimes, you know, come up in the bottom of the car. So yeah, I mean, we weren't, you know, ballers, but as a kid, you don't think about any of that stuff. So, you know, so many people are making all these assumptions about well that can't happen just because it hasn't happened in their lifetime but not only can it happen that's the most logical outcome is a major reset a major recession right i don't want really to get all doom and gloom and start talking about oh the great depression 2.0 but yes i mean that is a very real possibility and so when you start talking about bitcoin and thinking bitcoin's going to a gajillion dollars you know I just don't think that's realistic. And I, and I mean, I know people get upset about that, but I mean, that's just, it's not realistic. It's not impossible. Nothing is impossible, but just think about the environment. Think about what's going on in the world, right? Think about what's going on um, on the logical side and then look at the chart side. You know, this is oil, straight up parabolic move. We know how that ends. We've seen it over and over in crypto. Uh, this is, where's my lumber chart? This was lumber, right? Straight up, straight back down, right? We've all seen the Bitcoin chart. We know what Bitcoin does. It has a huge bubbles and then pops and over and over and over, boom, up, right? And then fell, you know, over 70%, or right at 70%, uh, 74.5% so far in this bubble pop, right? And then you look at, you ready? Set. Here is the NASDAQ. Oh, yeah. Wow. There's the dot-com bubble. And then an 84% drop. And here's the current move up. Remember the parabola rule we talked about earlier? You have a parabola that breaks, 80% retracements. That would be, you know, drawing it from back here, maybe even back here. But we'll say back here. It won't be quite as bad that way. Yeah, put it back down around 4,100, which would be where? Uh, right back at the old highs, right back at this range. 
I know it sounds absurd, but from a technical analysis standpoint, that makes perfect sense. Okay, uh, you look at the U.S. well, not the U.S. 30, but the uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Index. Sorry, and Dow Jones Industrial Average. Right, look at that. Mm, yeah, not right. Look at this. I mean, these are parabolic markets that are starting to finally come undone. Here's the SPX. Right. I mean, if you saw this chart on an altcoin, you would run away as fast as your feet could carry you. But people see it on stocks and are like, oh, you know, it doesn't happen in the stock market. Even though it does, it just doesn't happen as often because stocks move very, very slow, right? Moves that happen in six months or 12 months in crypto might take five years or 10 years in the stock market. This whole bubble, you know, really started back in 2009. Right, so that's what 13 years. Whereas in crypto, we've been getting these four year cycles. So, yeah, just use your head, use common sense. Obviously, technical analysis is going to give you a massive edge over the average person in the market, but also think about what's going on behind that technical analysis. Why do the charts look that way, and what would save them versus what would hurt them? And, and what would save them? I honestly have no idea what can save them. I do not know. Uh, if I had an idea, I would say, hey, if they could do this, maybe this might be what happens. The only thing I know is from a technical analysis side, it looks bad. And then you look at the logical side and it looks just as bad or worse. So those are my thoughts. Those are my opinions. Nothing more. I'm just some guy. I'm sitting in a spare bedroom. Obviously, nothing. The video is financial advice. You should always go out and do your own due diligence and seek out professional financial advice from a licensed financial advisor before making any type of investment in cryptocurrency, the stock market, precious metals, Forex or any other tradable asset. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and check the description. There will be a link where you can join my trading classes. You can learn technical analysis. You can also learn how to trade. You can also subscribe to my new TradingView indicators, which do most of the heavy lifting for you when it comes to technical analysis. And they simply spit out buy and sell signals that you can set alerts for. You can even automate those signals using third-party software. All right, this is James with Crypto Common Sense reminding you to all, please, please, Please trade safe. Your job as a trader is to come back and trade again tomorrow. Do not put yourself in a situation where if you're wrong, you lose all of your money. All right. So yeah, trade safe. Take care. I'll talk to you in the next video.